for the whole session here. Um, my name is Francois. I work in the commission department. I'm also a member of the Clinical Organization. Um, and I also support the uh, Princeton Graduate Student Union wholeheartedly. Um, and the talk today is about, you know, it's not so much criticism of Trump, it's about how to, you know, look at ourselves introspectively and see how we can respond to how to talk to people who are actually, you know, enthralled with you know, Trump's ideas. And, and it's all, you know, the, the response starts from ourselves and thinking about what assumptions we, we do have that may, might be wrong about our, ourselves and our world. I, um, I, uh, I, I recently discovered, uh, well actually I knew the guy before, but um, this is a uh, researcher called Bruno Latour. He's a social, sociologist of science. And he's uh, very well known for you know, being, bringing a lot of um, controversy in science and how researchers actually gather facts. Uh, and he's, um, he wrote an article after Trump's election in, uh, in Le Monde, uh, so the equivalent of the uh, New York Times in, in France. And I thought this article was very, uh, very good, very uh, astute, because he's talking about there's two, there's two bubbles. Um, and I'm going to you know, explain a little bit more here. He's saying that you know after the Brexit we had Trump's election and those two signs are very good signs to press to um, that, that that means the end of globalization. So what he's saying is that the deal with the globalization doesn't work anymore. It's kind of controversial for to say that, but um, the people who uh, actually uh, vote for Trump they're looking for uh, globalization as some sort of thing that doesn't work for them. So they're retreating to. To uh, you know, the return of nation states, borders, you know, more like you know, against against uh, against globalization. All right. So there's a, a divide that needs to be that needs to be uh, you know overcome. And and Latour is saying that there's a fault in both. People who are globalization enthusiasts don't understand that it's actually we need to go to look at a different model now. And of course, you know, the the people who retreat in the former reactionary uh, uh, thought. And of course, Trump is. Banking on that, so I want to I want to give the example. I want us to think about the attitude of scientists and and the academics and people who, who have like in this who are in those ivory towers towards ordinary people and put and try to put ourselves into the shoes of ordinary people when we hear us ourselves speaking. So to give you an example. Um, uh, I'm gonna. So we're gonna group. We, we're gonna group together. I'm gonna ask you. To, we're gonna watch a little bit of this video. I'm gonna ask you to group together and talk for like super fast for two or three minutes. I'm sorry, uh, you know it's gonna be a like super slow, super fast brainstorm. And maybe to guide your talk, um, you, could, you could maybe answer those questions that I highlighted here. Okay. So get ready. And I'm gonna time you and. <laughs> Radio. Okay. And I would like your your views on uh, the relative advantage of profit measuring, uh, doing assessments, and using them to measure proficiency or to measure measure growth. Thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, I think if if I'm understanding your question correctly around proficiency, I would I would also um, correlate it to competency and mastery, so that you. Each student is measured according to the um, advancement that they're making in each subject area. Well, that's growth. <laughs> that's not proficiency. So, in other words, the growth they're making is in growth. The proficiency is if an arbitrary reached, standard. If they reached a level. It, no, I'm talking about the debate between proficiency and growth. And yes. what, what your thoughts are on that? Well, this is this is a subject that is has been debated in the education community for years. And I, I advocated growth as the chairman and every member of this committee knows because with proficiency, uh, teachers uh, ignore the kids at the top who are not going to fall below proficiency and they ignore the kid at the bottom who no matter what they do will never get to proficiency. So I've been an advocate of growth. But it surprises me that you don't know this issue. <laughs> And Mr. Chairman, I think this is a good reason for us to have more questions. Because this is a very important subject, education, our kids' education. And I think we're selling our kids short. Okay. So, based on this quote-unquote dialogue, 
um, talk together and put yourself in the shoe of somebody uh, you know who don't who don't have a degree, or, you know, in in high high university, somebody a working class person, and hearing you know hearing her, hearing our Franken, Franken, you know, speeches and like try to feel like try to imagine yourself in the shoe of somebody who, who's listening to this. And so go ahead, talk, form little groups and talk about it. Um, just want to hear a couple of comments about the discussion you had. And I hope you understand that what I was trying to do is not for you to talk about the issue of education, but to talk about the fact that this issue of education is actually not being decided democratically. And it's legitimate for people to have, or nearly people, to have resentment against the uh, here, Al Franken represent the elite because he's saying, you know, oh, this has been known for 20 years. I didn't know. I didn't know myself. So, uh, you know. Um, so, question. Um, who, who asked her the question, that particular question? Who was it that asked her? Al Franken. Okay, you just yeah. said Al Franken. So he knew something. <laughs> yeah, but nobody else does. Anybody else wants to? I'm just wondering, it seems like a kind of weird characterization of elite that's kind of formed. Because, I mean, in, in this example, you're kind of positioning Al Franken as the elite, despite Betsy DeVos being a billionaire. And, right. you know, exactly. one of the wealthiest couple thousand people on the planet. What do you guys think about that? I, and I, I, I agree with you, but I want people yeah. to, think, yeah. to think about what you just said. I think yeah. this is one of these example, example of, uh, when we were talking about your situation, and what you know. So I know a little bit about growth versus proficiency because I have a special needs child and we often talk about his education in terms of growing versus if he's proficient and so on in terms of his IEP and his individualized education plan and stuff. So I would know about this stuff. But if you have a child who's reasonably you know, smart going through the education system, this is not, this is not this is stuff that you think about. You think about who's he in the quotation next year from after. So it's like, if it's not, on your radar, you're not going to know about it. So it really has, it doesn't have to do whether you're elite or not, but maybe where you are in terms of it. Actually, just to respond to your thing about the odd characterization of <laughs> elitism, um, you know, I, I would assume that people who supported President Trump would uh, be supportive because they legitimately believe that whatever he does will be done in, with their best interests in mind, would then believe that despite being a billionaire, she would legitimately be working in favor of them. And if they can easily conflate the issues of growth and proficiency, as she does, and they see her getting tripped up by that too, it would seem to me like from their perspective, Senator Franken's um, characterization of this issue was sort of trying to draw a distinction where there's no difference, just for the purposes of trying to trip her up on national yeah, TV. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, uh, I like the way this is going. Another example, another example um, the nuclear triad. And he mentioned the triad. The B-52s are older than I am, the missiles are old, the submarines are aging out. It's an executive order, it's a commander-in-chief decision. What's your priority among our nuclear triad? Well, first of all, I think we need somebody absolutely that we can trust, who's totally responsible, who really knows what he or she is doing. That is so powerful and so important. Nuclear change is the whole ballgame. Frankly, I would have said, get out of Syria, get out. If we didn't have the power of weaponry today, the power is so massive. That's, in my opinion, that is the single biggest problem that our country faces. Of the three legs of the triad, though, do you have a priority? And I want to go to Senator Rubio well, I, after I think, that. I think him. for me, nuclear is just the, the power, the devastation is very important. Donald Trump has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he is a, uh, basically a long-standing um, U.S. Uh, doctrine, I guess you could say, or a strategic doctrine on the use of nuclear weapons, that there are three elements, by sea, uh, by land, or by air. I mean, this is pretty basic stuff. Doesn't take a genius to figure this out. Right. What is strategically the best way to deliver these nuclear weapons? Okay, so this is again another snippet of a, a conversation between you know, Trump 
and him being ignorant of so important you know issue about the nuclear triad and you know put people responding to his ignorance by you know trying to to, to, to uh, convey the that the importance of the nuclear triad without even understanding to be honest uh, whether it's important or not or in what context so I'm, I want to us to do the same thing again, group, same, maybe same group, and answer the same question together, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up after that. So go ahead. Uh, so we uh, we're gonna wrap up. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, and actually, the issue should be discussed. And actually, Ramana is gonna like, talk a little bit more you feel about, you know, about the, uh, or, the role of the experts and the, maybe the complicity of the experts uh, into you know the path into uh, establishing a power relationship that is anti-democratic. Thank you. So I have nothing to show it yet. <laughs> so I'm going to just sort of pop from here. But uh, I want to sort of pick on the uh, issue that Francois talked about, which is the notion of sort of elites and experts and you know trying to sort of show off. And I want to start by first um, making a distinction between the notion of an expert and expertise. Right? And the difference is that lots of people have expertise, but only some are regarded by society, by the powers that be as experts. Right? And as an example, so I work sort of largely in, on nuclear things, and I obsess about nuclear things, nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, things of that sort. Um, but, um, you know, so if I were to be on some interview or some, you know, one of these things, they'll probably say, here's a nuclear expert from um, Princeton, all right? Now, I have a friend uh, called Jackie Chabasso. Um, so she is a, uh, in California. She works with an organization called Western States Legal Foundation. She's a high school dropout. Uh, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s, she got into the freeze movement. She studied the US nuclear weapons complex her whole life. Right? She knows 100 times more about it than I would ever know. Right? But she would never be regarded as an expert. Right? So I think one of the things we should recognize is that the role, roles of experts very different from just one possessing expertise on a certain issue, right? And you know, the um, for many of us, you know, who are in Princeton and so on, it's very easy for us to become called experts, right? And we sort of have some expertise in something, uh, and we you know have a certain social role that's often bestowed upon us. And the question that we can uh, we should ask ourselves is, what do we do with this expertise and the potential status that we get as experts? And what can we do in this? this current conjecture, where one of the things that you see is the fact that there is this vast divide, right? You know, we've been talked about as the 1% and the 99%, if you want, you know, there's many, many ways in which this division between the, the few and the many are sort of amplified, right? And the question is whether we are going to use our expertise in ways that actually amplify this divide, or you're going to actually work sort of with the, with the people at large, right? And for the most part, I mean, you know, the uh, it just is a matter of fact that for the most part, many of these experts play a part in actually um, helping uh, this this uh, is division uh, and helping those who are in power, right? And this is why, in some sense, there is a certain kind of skepticism that you see among people, the common people, about these so-called experts. Right? So I'll give you an example from you know something that I, I work on. So in uh, India. Um, after the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011, uh, there was a lot of debate. There were some huge protests over a particular nuclear power plant that was being constructed in the southern part of the country in a place called Pudampura, right? And in this debate, the chairperson of the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, a material scientist, um, uh, he sort of intervenes the debate by saying the probability of an accident in India is one in infinity, in other words, zero. Uh, now, you know, obviously, eyebrows have to be raised at that point. It doesn't make any sense, uh, you know, even for us, you know, in science, we say, look, yes, I can understand that it's a small probability, maybe one in a million reactor years, etc., etc. But how can you possibly say it's zero, right? That's the question that comes to your mind. But as somebody was, sort of, uh, I saw this placard in a sign, uh, placard in a rally after Fukushima where somebody has a sign that says, you know, probability of a nuclear reactor accident, one in 10 million years. 
number of nuclear meltdowns in my lifetime, yeah. five. <laughs> right? So there's a certain disjuncture that you can see that you know these people are coming in terms in service of those who want to build these nuclear power plants. They're sort of lending their expertise, lending their prestige to sort of reinforce this position, right? And so this is sort of one of those examples where uh, you know we see this. Now, if you ask this question to you know a group of us, for example, you know. Why is this guy doing this? This is right. And most people would say, oh, this is just corrupt science. This is a scientist who's sort of really not doing what he or she is supposed to be doing. Right? This is corruption. And then the question you want to ask is, you know, why do we see this as corruption in the first place? Why do we sort of not see this as the natural order of things? And the second is that, why is there this corruption? Right? If you do agree that there is corruption. And I think the, the first question, I think the answer to to, to the place to start with is that scientists and academics and so on have a certain self-image of themselves, right? And that self-image is typically, you know, we are disinterested, you know, driven by curiosity, neutral, objective. These are the kinds of adjectives you would sort of uh, uh, lend to that, right? And there's a lot of truth to that, right? Uh, because, you know, when we think about science, we think of all the you know, great things, you know, Einstein and general relativity, you know, what practical, you know, application could there possibly be, right? You know, just pure abstract thought in a sense, right? But the thing to remember is that science has a kind of dual nature. Uh, so there, on the one hand, it is this curiosity-driven sort of uh, process. You ask questions and you try to answer them according to a set of rules that are uh, decided on by this community of people who are scientists, right? And the same thing holds for social scientists and humanities people and so on. So I, I'm using the sciences because my training is in physics, so I'm giving examples from there. But if you think about something like general relativity, it's, though it's abstract, it actually comes as a result of a long series of uh, questions that were asked of which had their origins in very practical questions. So the, if you look at the intellectual history of how general relativity comes from, it comes from Einstein and special relativity, which in turn comes from the fact that there were people trying to understand how electromagnetic waves propagate. And that is a very practical question. How do you set up radio waves, things of that sort? And if you go even further back, it goes back to Faraday and you know doing stuff with electricity and magnetism and generating electricity. So this this is sort of an example of something where some of the questions that science tries to tackle are things which are set by people who seek to profit from it, who seek to use it. And but are, there are also questions which come because of the internal nature of science. And um, the second point, of course, is that um, why is this, this corruption? Why do these people like the Atomic Energy Commission person I mentioned or a whole bunch of other people who have talked about you know, how there is pollution is not a problem, you know, climate change is not a problem, uh, and all kinds of things. And there, you know, the, the point to remember is that um, in our times, you know, science is a very large uh, enterprise and requires a huge amount of resources. We also live through that kind of resources. And the reason why these resources are provided to us in a sense, is because science produces various commodities, right? Things that can be used, uh, and you know the notion. You know, sort of. Uh, Dennis will talk a little bit more about what 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 we mean by commodities. But you can think about something as anything that has, um, you know, anything that can be sold, right? And what can be or can, that can be put to use, and the, whether it's sold or can be put to use are slightly distinct, right? So we talked about exchange value and use value, right? And usually things which don't have any use value can't be exchanged. But that doesn't mean that everything which has the same use has the same exchange. And a good example is um, this uh, biologist uh, uh, Richard Levins, Dick Levins from Harvard, sort of gives this example of how you might try to deal with plants being, uh, farmers trying to deal with insects and pests in their farm. So one way to deal with that is to, of course, make pesticides. Right? And this is, there's a huge amount of research and development that goes into that. Another way to deal with that might be to sort of grow plants in different ways. So you have, instead of having one kind of monoculture crops, you have multiculture crops, and then one sort of stops the pest from advancing and things of that sort. Now, if you, if you try to sort of advance the second as your way to deal with pesticides, that's not something that any co company can profit from. So it's no wonder that they don't sort of fund those kinds of work as much as uh, the other one. Right? Um, I mean, commodities can also be ideas. Uh, you know, it could be, the, for example, the idea of sociobiology or the idea of the bell curve, which sort of justifies the fact that African Americans in the, in the United States are predominantly in worse off positions than uh, whites, right? Uh, so that's, I think, another issue. Um, 
I will sort of um, end by sort of saying three things, and we can talk about all this later, but I, sort of in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. Um, you know, what can we sort of do about this, and what is, what, how do we sort of start with this? I think the first point to remember is that um, we want to think about, um, reflect on the self-image itself, right? So, you know, where is it that we are sort of, be self-reflexive about what we are doing. Now, many of us cannot escape this, right? You have to, you live in this kind of a society where, you know, one way or the other, you are sort of in, uh, imbued in the system, but being critical of that, being trying to do stuff outside of that is helpful. The second point I think which I, is to be remembered is that uh, it's it's the time to sort of take sides. It's always been the time to take sides, more more true today than than, uh, than before. And where do we take sides? What does it mean to say take sides? And I think you know in terms of the kind of power structures that we see around us, there is no it's very difficult to sort of take sides within the ivory tower, within the sort of elite circles. You really have to look out to social movements, to people who are struggling, and say, you know, where do we get our cues from there? So I'll stop there and go into the next. We'll have some time for questions later on. That's why I'm sort of rushing for this. My name is Dennis Bonner, and I have to admit this is my first talk and a political activist type of talk, so a little bit of thanks to Donald Trump, but <laughs> organizers of this day of action. So, it's very good how Ramana said the notion of uh, commodity, and in my, my part of the talk, I would like to discuss science and capitalism. And for example, uh, recently, former Democratic Minority Leader actually said, answer, uh, oh, she was asked a question by a student, by a young student that said that most of the young people below 30, they actually reject um, seem to reject capitalism, and she replied that, thank you for your question, but I have to say that we are capitalists, and that's just the way it is. So what the hell is capitalism? You know, this, this, is very good, this is a very good thing to ask, and how we as a scientist relate to, to this economic mode. And I thought what's the best you know, place to ask is you know, Karl Marx, this old dude, he knows quite a bit about it. And so I would like to cite only only the first, very first sentence of Das Kapital. This is the first sentence, the first volume, the first sentence. The wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense collection of commodities. We'll come back to this appears. <laughs> so, but commodities, basically sum of commodities for now, so it's the wealth of our society. So how does commodity get produced? So assume you're a job creator, i.e. capitalist, <laughs> and you have some money, initial money, you borrow them or you got somewhere, and here's the world at your disposal. You have some people and some nature, of course, there's a, it's a very symbiotic relationship between both. But you want to make some money at the end. So what do you do? You do two things. You're going to spend your initial investment on two things. You're going to buy raw materials and machinery which we call means of production, and you're going to hire some workers. And in other words, you're buying labor power. And so this arrow basically represents wage, and this arrow represents you know, the price of commodities, the price of equipment. Now, you know, as a government, you don't really care about people. It's, you just really want <laughs> workers, and uh, you know, in other things, you, this is an abstraction, right? You just want workers to show up at nine, and stay as long as possible. And so the capitalism is always abstract these two things. This is an organic symbiosis, but from his or her point of view, it just means of production and labor power. These are just commodities that you buy. And of course, they form the initial, what, what just now happened is that you just transform money into stuff. Right? Nothing changed. Amount, value, initial value, and here the same value, it's the same thing. Um, now, the next stage is the most important. Now you start the production, you start mixing people with materials. And what's interesting is that during the production, uh, the original amount of stuff actually gets enlarged. You, re you reproduce what you put inside, and plus a little bit more. And so how does this happen? Um, the how the value? Yes, 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 the value, the, you produce more. And how does this happen, actually? Like, so I said the first step, the, the value of this is equal to value of that, but the value of this is not any more equal to value of this. This is larger, in, if everything goes well. Um, and uh, because, you know, another arrow is basically, you know, this is a 
these two arrows are basically also labor movements, strikes, how much gets spent on the wage, how much gets spent you know, on, on the commodities. Uh, this is a very complex uh, diagram. So this also represents some you know, women's rights, uh, LGBTQ it's a discrimination, and all this racism goes here into this small arrow actually. And so the reason is that actually why more value gets produced is because you, a job creator, bought a worker what labor power and the labor is not the same as which you exert more labor than you were paid for and let me just and of course by production it actually means everything it means you know actual manufacturing maybe software engineering can be knowledge creation R and D uh, etc etc it can absolutely anything it, it relates to us as a scientist working under some contracts um, and let me just remind you. Um, how you know production looks like? Of course, this is classics. This is Modern Times by Charles Chaplin. engage in manufacturing I mean they experience the same thing actually it's, it's absolutely modern actually movie it's not it's not made it's not obsolete um, so you know in our case in case of scientists this is going to be kind of you know uh, you will produce more articles than you read you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, so the, I would like to draw attention that science in, in the production uh, portion portion of capitalism employs employs an absolutely important part right this machinery that you just saw uh, were designed by scientists and engineers. So if you know, working people don't feel too much sympathetic for budget cuts in science, you know, one has to remember Charlie Chaplin's movie uh, and who brought those, those machines. Now, there comes the next stage of realization. Now you need to s sell all those commodities to convert this back into money. And again, um, realization um, involves many things like trade, marketing, advertisement, uh, <coughs> logistics, etc., etc. So again, the science plays absolutely very important role. Uh, there, like computer science, hardcore scientists play an important role. Here, more like social scientists play a very important role. Um, so, once again, you see the, the two pillars of capitalism based on science. And of course, the, the money, um, assume everything goes well, everything gets sold, so you get money, and now, portion of this money is you're ready to reinvest and it's going to be because of this circles being created it's going to be at next stage uh, a little bit more is created so that you will be able to start a bit large and of course there is a state kind of which which connects all these pieces and in modern society this, the role of state is actually contrary to many myths it's not to suppress you know production or do some kind of distribution but to ensure that this motion goes as smoothly as possible actually of course sometimes they can play a progressive role by say taxing you know some in industries distribution circuits and financial markets and give them to labor power. but it could be absolutely opposite you can tax more people and <laughs> redistribute uh, in any other circuits of capital um, so of course, well, what happens next? At the next stage, you you what was your final? You put it back initial, then the circle continues, and it all gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> and you see the problem here, uh, inherent problem, and this is very fascinating, is that so since you need more of raw materials and com commodities, 
you know, it puts more pressure on nature. So this arrow denotes environmental issues, climate change, etc., etc. So since you need more workers, it requires actually it requires kind of growth of the population. This is why the you know the basically there's no growth in human population for until like 17th century, um, and so this. Again, this, uh, the, uh, on the other hand, it requires to develop, to development of new technology so that you can speed up this, you know, this uh, uh, production cycle, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, that's sort of that was uh, probably Karl Marx turned a few times in his grave. This is, was a caricature <laughs> of his three volumes, and um, anyway, so uh, this is again the same thing. And uh, Francois would like to draw some conclusion, and let's open the floor for a few. Discussions, a few questions. We just wrote the conclusion like half an hour ago, and Ramana wasn't here, so just want to make sure he agrees. Um, but you know, I mean, what what we uh, recognize to take you know, action to be taken. First of all, I think it's good to raise awareness among your colleague about you know the uh, this kind of elitist status that we have and reject it. And if rejected everywhere, it appears. That's uh, very that's very important because it, it puts us closer to ordinary people, and frankly, uh, you know, we're not we're we're interested in making society better, right? So we want to put ourselves to the level of ordinary people. I think that's a pr kind of a prerequisite. The second thing is that, uh, well, as I was saying, and uh, you know, we we're we're uh, supportive of the uh, Princeton Graduate Student Union. In fact, I have cards if any, any graduate student wants to sign the card, uh, we can send it. Because what does a, a union do is actually bring you a little bit of power at the workplace. And this power is not just a power about bringing you know, bread and butter, it's also a little political power, the power to make some decisions about who's being hired, your work tempo also, for example, uh, et, cetera, et cetera. And then I think what's another important thing is that we don't have, we have two capitalist parties in this, in this country. It's called the Republicans and the Democrats. And as long as we don't have a third party that is not capitalist, and Nancy Pelosi made it clear that the Democrats are capitalists, we'll, we will not be able to overcome uh, the problems of society. And we're going to see more and more of you know, people being alienated from those two uh, capitalist parties and joining you know, uh, reactionary politics. And then uh, you know, I think uh, what's on the agenda very quickly in, the, in today's is the international movement. Women they strike. So I think people, if people support the strike, you should wear red. But also for women, you should, if you aren't, have the possibility to go on strike, if you have the possibility to not buy uh, or buy local during that day, uh, please let's, let's, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Discussion. Oh, can I ask a qu question? Or? Yeah, I think they're all reserved. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so what you're talking about sort of it begs the question of what you said before, which really struck me about your friend, who she's not going to be um, experienced as an expert, and yet she's an expert, which is a difficult thing that you're talking about because how do you get your elite? You know, certainly Princeton is elitist. You know, how do you? The question is how to get the elitist to not the elitist. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, how does that happen? That's that's a great question. I, I, do, I don't have any expertise in sort of answering that question. Yeah. Just after it. <laughs> but but I think that you know I think I would say start with yourself in the yeah, first place, absolutely. right? And then you know absolutely. people Good. that you know. That's what I would say. But if anybody else wants to pitch in to say something on that, that's also fine. But yeah. What are the odds of getting uh, corporate America or the you know, control the media production to accept salaries that are not a thousand times what their workers are being paid, or in other words, in proportion to what their workers are paid, because that's the solution to enter to uh, prosperity for everybody, for them mm -hmm. as well as for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Well, this kind of this yeah. well, Can I actually respond to your first question? Yes, please. I think if you want to fight elitists, you ha I think the number one thing is you have to get money out of the system. Like the entire campaign finance system in the United States is just completely rotten to the core. Mm -hmm. So you have to get that out of the system before and all the lobbying out of the system if you want to actually make change. And second, you have to actually vote for people who are not taking large amounts of money from whatever. Right? Uh, 
Um, so you have to kind of pay attention. Because the people that get the most attention, the most ads, are the people who, who get a lot of money. So you have to kind of ignore them. You have to research a little bit to see if there are grassroots uh, candidates. Right. Uh, I also had a question. So for the third point, the obvious question to the third point is just that third parties in the United States are very, very hard to get them going because you have a system that just completely works against them. Like Green Party, uh, Gary Johnson, uh, they, they couldn't even get into the base, right? So do you think that's a feasible option? Or should you try to work within one of the parties? Or let's, like, let's say you primary Democrats, for example. I think it's more realistic to try to build an alternative party than trying to reform the Democratic Party. Okay. If you look at the history of the Democratic Party in the United States, you see plenty of attempts over the years since, uh, since the 30s to mm -hmm. actually reform the Democratic Party, and every time the, the movement that we're looking for this ended up being swallowed up by electoral politics and voting for, for uh, Democratic Party. So it's a machine, the Democratic Party is a machine that is here to suck up movement and, and channel them to electoral politics and to give you back you know, what Nancy Pelosi says, uh, capitalist politics. So it's, you know, whatever you, you decide, I think it's, there's more uh, chance build a third party. We need to persevere. Yeah. So the, there's a common refrain which you might have heard right now, which is that the Democratic Party has a vacuum at the lower levels. And this has been pretty pretty widely said at this point. And simultaneously, there's a movement to sort of create a, a, a third party or a nationally coordinate third party actions at those local levels, going all the way down to school boards and all the way up to maybe even like state center bases and stuff like that. So I think you're exactly right. Doing it at the national level is inconceivable at the moment. But if there were a network of, and people are working on this right now, a network of sort of local parties, Working Families Party is doing a really great job in New York City, for instance, um, you could you could make that more feasible in a generation or so. And I think that's that's the right way to go, as far as I'm concerned. Can I just answer your question sure. about uh, some salaries? <coughs> so when I was presenting this kind of caricature of capitalism, it's actually, there's nothing, like, there's no ethical judgment about the system in, in, in from your remarks. And, the, the only motive is to make a profit, and if, if it's actually if if people take less for salary, or like if, if there are people who take less, you you have to pay less than, as a job creator, just because it's it's not an ethical issue. It's unless the people organize themselves uh, into unions or other trade movements, uh, the there is no incentive for the employer to actually pay salary, and but this is historically proven. There are employers who do it, and they are successful. They will be beaten by the market, by the competitors. That's again historical evidence. So this, the nature of the competition actually forces everyone to lower the denominator. Not only workers, but also capitalists. They, because of the competition, they actually start getting less and less profit. And and this is actually crisis. I mean, but that's a different topic. Good. Princeton is one of the research universities that is a model and I um, have attended talks recently where, where um, much of the research money is funneled to the elite universities and it's the graduates of um, programs here that are spread throughout the country and it's, um, is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking us? <laughs> Whether it's fair or not, it's not democratic. It, it's, not it's not democratic. No, no, but um, do you think there will be the pressure the Trump? Oh, do, you, do I think they will change the balance of this? Do you think they will? Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot which is said about the Trump administration being anti-science. Yeah. Right? And uh, there is some truth to that, but there's also, it's a very narrow view of what science is. For the most part, what people mean when they say Trump is anti-science, he's anti-climate change science, mm -hmm. right? Or he's anti-sort of environmental sciences, which might tell that there's a problem with fracking or there's the kinds of economic activities that that administration wants to push. Those, uh, you know, anything that comes in the way of those interests are what they sort of oppose in the sense. 
there are other parts of science. If you, if you were to propose a way by which you can sort of mine coal more efficiently, or you can you know find new gas reserves and find efficient ways of improving them, I'm sure the administration will sort of gladly fund it. Right? So it's a question of trying to see what kind of science. And so then the next question comes from, does Princeton do which kind of science more, and who's doing that, and so on and so forth. And it's a very mixed place. So there are going to be people who will get funding, and there are going to be people who will be starved of funding. I think one of the things as, as scientists that, uh, in terms of also as educators that would be useful is to make sure that you're not just looking at what you're doing just inside of your lab, but making sure you include and, and get yourself educated on what's going on in industry, in you know, in different areas to make sure what you're doing in your lab is sort of realistic and do really truly doable, and that way you're 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 not a scientist elite. You're sort of taking what's real, what's what's going on in real life and making sure your science can really truly apply to that at some point and making sure that that you're not ignoring that because that again if you're sort of really ignoring what's going on out there that people are doing in <coughs> industry or work or work, workers I, I used to work for OSHA and I know I had this elitist dream of protecting all these employees and all this stuff and that and, but when I really got out there I realized in some cases what I wanted to do probably wasn't truly realistic and possible. So it's like sort of making sure you sort of have that healthy balance and can making I, sure you introduce it. Can I ask your question? I mean, I think it can be posed as, as a question also. Is it possible for scientists or uh, academics, people who produce knowledge, to actually have more control of the knowledge you want to produce? Is it possible? And can we, can we have control, ultimate control, or not? What degree do we have control about the, uh, the knowledge we produce? Just in response to that, to what degree do you expect <coughs> realism? What does realism mean? Do you do you want to stop funding for cosmology research because it doesn't have a practical use that we know of yet? Because it took a while for general relativity to develop to the point where the technology could then catch up for us to use it in GPS-based uh, navigation. Mm -hmm. For example, so so what does that really mean? But also, I think I would also push back on the notion of realistic. I mean, some to some extent, what we have to be is not realistic. I mean, we want we are trying to find different, make a world slightly different place, right? And that's not a very realistic. Uh, I think that <laughs> what I was trying to say is that you sort of have to be, if you don't have some sense of what's really going on, then you seem elitist. So I think you need to have both, right. like a healthy balance. Okay. But I, if I, you're I need not. To find out I mean, yeah, I, I see this as kind of a crisis for science in that most scientists are working in their lab on something that they within their lifetime will never see applied anywhere, and you know, you really have to, you know, convince yourself that it's important to do the work. But at, the, at a time like this, especially, many scientists are wondering, you know, should I is, is are things going too quickly to not be involved? Like, should I should I abandon this kind of work within a lab and actually get out and do something? And I, I mean, I don't know that there's a good answer to. So how to think about basic science and fundamental research in a time like this. It's just got me thinking. So I think you have to step back a little bit when you say what we are working on. I'm not, I don't know exactly what you do, but you know, many people do when they think of doing fundamental science is not applicable, right? And I'll give you an example from you know, a friend of mine who did his PhD in UC Irvine. Uh, uh, and so the, the person who he was working with was did uh, was studying sort of lasers and uh, uh, material, you know, materials, right? And his idea was to try and understand the quantum mechanics of how these uh, light interacts with matter, right? So it was for him, in his mind, it was a very theoretical enterprise, right? And he got funding from the U.S. Air Force, right? Why is the U.S. Air Force funding this? It's abstract science, right? That's what you're thinking about, and this is what they write in their annual reports. You go read the annual report of the U.S. Air Force about why they're funding this, and they make it very clear. They say, basically, we, this was in the 70s, by the way. So they were trying to develop a stealth plane, all right? And to, under, to get a stealth plane, you have to understand how radars interact with the skin of the, of the airplane, right? That involves a whole range of expertise on quantum mechanics of you know, light and uh, matter interaction, right? So there is often you know, these long-term or even medium-term sort of applications for lots of what you do, right? And it's not something which you should sort of lose sight of. Having said that, it's also, I think, important to remember that sometimes, you know, society does not always work only
only on practical things. I mean, people do support, you know, painting and, and you know, music and so on and so forth, even willingly, right? Uh, so that's something which we should sort of remember, not necessarily get straight jacket into that. And that's being straight jacket into this, you know, let's get funding for this, let's do practical stuff. This happens all the time, and we are all sort of faced with that, right? So. Yeah, so uh, just in response to that question, so this guy thought he was just studying the quantum mechanics of lasers, but what the Air Force was funding him for was a very different reason. Mm -hmm. So to what extent should we as scientists, I mean, this is more of a question, this is something I grapple with, is that uh, to what extent should you question the motives of your funding agencies? Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you're, if you're working on artificial intelligence, it could be put to use in drones that are going to kill people, and you don't have control over where the technology goes, so should you... Uh, so should you stop yourself from doing that kind of research, not take money from organizations which have a uh, known history of killing people? I mean, that's just one extreme example, but so what do you, uh, I mean, this is an open... I think this is something which each of us has to answer for themselves. I mean, I'm very reluctant to tell people, oh, you should do this, yeah. right? I, I mean, I would speak for myself and I would say, okay, I would probably move out of that field. I mean, no. that's only me, right? And I'm, you know, people are not always in the, in the, in the sort of aristocratic or luxury position of being able to pick and yeah, jobs, exactly, right? Yeah. People who work in, in yeah. armament factories, they probably know very well that you know they're, what they're producing is going to go out to kill people, but they don't have any other job to work in, right? They may mm -hmm. not, right? So mm -hmm. these are difficult questions, and I don't want to sort of make it. I'll say relevant to that, there's an exhibit right now at MoMA about the immigrants to like chemical agencies in Vietnam and the scientists who developed them, so you should look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I want to say something else, I mean, we, we are scientists and we're not, you know, we, we very often think about in a very individualistic way without being judgmental, it's the way we, we operate in, in times. Um, and the, 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 to the extent to which you should think about how you can counter or refuse to do the science that you don't like is to how much power do you have? How much social power do you have? And as an individual, you have literally zero power. I am working in the lab. And whatever my boss tells me to do, I can, you know. So I don't, sometimes I don't even say that I'm, I'm against it because I'm, uh, I'm I don't want to jeopardize my position. So the best way to answer your question, to what extent, is to ex the extent that you build your power. And to be honest, we should look at workers, how workers build their power. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, is through combining and seeing the common interest that they have. And we are closer to workers than, you know. The, Politicians or those people, those layer of people who are closer to the ruling class than, than, uh, than uh, we think. We're almost out of time, so maybe one last yeah. question. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of the workers, though, um, uh, what's happening now, I mean, not to mention, in addition to the federal level, states, uh, Scott Walker, I mean, they're trying to get rid of unions. So now you're finding, you know, uh, forget about the federal, it doesn't even matter what the federal <laughs> government does. You've got states that are really depriving uh, workers of their powers. So, I mean... Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's spreading, it's a race to the bottom in a way. Yeah. So, yeah. so that box that said nature and people is shrinking while the others are... <laughs> larger. larger. <laughs> right. um, On that note, we should... Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. Yeah. thank you very much. So we have we have a uh,